Good evening. It's now Wednesday of Holy Week, and today the trap for Jesus will be set. Judas Iscariot will meet with the temple leaders, and he will accept money in exchange for delivering Jesus into their hands. But before that happens, we're going to look tonight at some of the so-called apocalyptic sayings of Jesus and what they mean. Jesus is finding himself, of course, in ever greater danger from the temple leaders. Our opening song once again is Lord Make Me Like an Olive Tree. We're using it throughout Holy Week and the evergreen leaves of the olive tree remind us to keep being faithful to our baptismal calling. Lord make me like an olive tree whose leaves forever green shall be Spring times wild winds blow. I'll trust the Lord wherever I go. I'll offer thanks for what you've done to be my light, my star, my sun. We continue with a prayer of awareness. Eternal God, in tonight's scripture, Judas Iscariot will accept money for giving up Jesus to the authorities. The story seems all too familiar in our world, when underhanded actions are commonplace. Yet realistically, we know that the world has not actually changed. There have always been people who will cheat and lie. Sometimes it seems as if Jesus was blowing smoke when he said, the kingdom of God has drawn near. We ask, what can we do? In these evening prayers for Holy Week, we've seen that Jesus did not shy away from challenging temporal, temporal authorities, even at the risk of his own safety, even his life. And so gracious God, we pray that we may have the courage of Jesus to challenge the status quo, even when that is hard to do and might expose us to ridicule or worse. Because we must stand up for truth, otherwise exaggerations, fake news and outright lies will come to be accepted as the truth. Eternal God, keep us aware. Amen. Our scripture tonight is taken from Luke chapter 21 at the, towards the end to the beginning of chapter 22. Jesus said there will be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint with fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told the crowd a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God has come near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. Every day Jesus was teaching in the temple, and at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives, and all the people would get up early in the morning to listen to him in the temple. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot. Judas went and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray Jesus to them. They were greatly pleased and they agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when no crowd was present. I've always been fascinated by the expression the Son of Man. That's because it seems to me to be less holy sounding than the Son of God. The son of the Son of Man, with a definite article, was an innovation of the Gospel writers. 
It derived from a less clear term, son of man or son of Adam in Hebrew scripture. Matthew, Mark and Luke all quote directly from the book of Daniel, with the son of man quotes coming down on clouds of great glory. Daniel 7 describes how the ancient of days, that's God, gives dominion over the earth to one like a son of man. Daniel's son of man probably did not represent the Messiah. That interpretation was introduced by later authors in the pre-Christian period. However, I think it's unlikely that Jesus spoke these words himself. More probable is that many other prophetic voices had been called sons of God. And that made the term seem perhaps rather unexceptional. The gospel writers, of course, wanted to emphasize that Jesus was a unique personality. But this is apocalyptic writing about the so-called end times. As I've emphasized several times, the gospel evidence is that Jesus saw himself as the Jewish Messiah, God's anointed one. The one who would bring God's righteous rule here on earth. Hence his saying in Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God has drawn near. But early Christians had a problem. The kingdom had not come. The earthly Jesus had died. Therefore, either Jesus wasn't the Messiah or his work had been interrupted. That made a second coming, as we call it, necessary to complete the work of kingdom building. That was another reason for putting Daniel's prophecy into Jesus' mouth. Gospel writers updated their concept of who Jesus was. That was simply to take later events and later ideas about Jesus into account. Whatever may have been Jesus' original parable about a fig tree, it looks to me that the piece about, quotes, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place, must be editorial in nature. It represents the hope of early Christians that Christ will return soon, within their lifetimes. But clearly that did not happen. And so we come to the arrangement between Judas Iscariot and the chief priests. As to Judas' motivations, I'll include that tomorrow in my Maundy Thursday homily. For now, I'll just comment that Judas gave the temple leaders what they had been searching for, for much of Jesus' ministry, and especially since Jesus had entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Judas' agreement with them represents the climax or the outcome of what Holy Week evening prayers have been leading up to because now Jesus' arrest and execution have become inevitable. And now a time of prayer. Loving God, we ask you to look kindly on our efforts, times when we succeed in playing a small part in bringing your kingdom closer, the times when we try and fail, as well as the times when, consciously or unconsciously, we stray from your path. Bring out the best in us, we pray, especially as we follow Jesus' time of testing, as the clouds of death gather around him. Help us to set aside all that is not holy or of good report, especially at this time. Amen. We now ask your help to live out our baptismal promises. Keep us free from the evils of discrimination, all those isms, racism, sexism, genderism, ageism, ableism, Help us to remember to treat all that we meet with respect and care, just as we would wish to be treated by other people. For this is the commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples when he met them for the last time before his betrayal. It's the same one he gives to us today, that we should love one another. And help us, we pray, not to forget the baptismal promise to care for creation, so that our grandchildren's grandchildren may enjoy the same forests, lakes, and oceans that we enjoy today. Amen. We now recite together our collect for Holy Week. Merciful God, as we continue our journey through Holy Week, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith, that we may not only praise him with our lips, but may follow him in our lives. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Our Mother and Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Amen. Our closing song is Calm Me, Lord. When... Calm me, Lord, as you calm the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease and fold me, Lord, and hold me in your peace. Calm me, Lord, as you calm the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease and fold me, Lord, and fold me in your peace. As a closing prayer, O oh God, you've given us the joys and challenges of this day. Now, as the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, we ask for a quiet night and a holy and refreshing time of sleep. And then, when the day returns and renewed through the wellsprings of your grace, Lead us, O God, on the journey of justice, and guide us, O God, on the pathway of peace. Amen. Our blessing was written by John Philip Newell. In the coming hours of darkness, may there be light in our dreams. In the stillness of sleep, may there be strength in our souls. In the wakeful watches of the night, may there be peace in our minds, light for new vision, strength to make sacrifice, and peace for our world. On the, on the pathways of Earth's journey this night, let there be peace. Amen.